This week on the Computer Chronicles, a user-friendly guide to the Internet. If you're a newbie, we'll show you how to log on, teach you how to use a web browser, and give you a beginner's class in Netiquette. We'll look at security in cyberspace, ways to protect your kids and your credit card number. We'll show you Java, the hottest new thing on the web, and we'll take you to the set of Ferndale, the first online soap opera on the Internet. All this plus Giles Online, this week's computer news, my pick of the week, all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers, developing PCs for business. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that plotter. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. If you're a newbie, you need to know the basics about getting on and around the Internet. So we're going to start out with the baby stuff, and Hallie Silver is going to be our guide. You're a webmaster or webmistress, maybe, if you're a woman. I don't know. I call myself a web mercenary. Pay me, I'll do it, right? <laughs> Pay me, I'll do it. Okay, let's start with the basics. I, don't do any, I haven't done anything yet. I want to get on the Internet. What do I need for hardware and software? You need a computer with at least four megs of RAM. You need a modem, preferably a 28.8, and then you need some so uh, internet connection software. In a Mac, that would be a control panel, a few control panels, and a PC. It's called a WinSock. Okay. Um, now, where do I get that? Uh, usually, your internet software provider will give that to you. You can also, it also comes in internet in a box kits. Uh, okay, we're talking newbies. You said my internet service provider, what's that? Um, it's a company or a group of people with computers that your, com your modem will dial into. So give me examples. I mean, where do I find this? Um, you can look in the yellow pages. If you have AOL or CompuServe or Prodigy, mm -hmm. you can probably find listings of Internet service providers in your area looking there. Okay. Or if I buy something like Internet in a Box at a software store, Some of them come uh, pre-configured with uh, national Internet service providers. Okay. Next step is I want to get on the World Wide Web, and I, I hear I need a browser. What's a browser, and where do I get that? A browser is a piece of software like, like Netscape, which we have here, mm -hmm. that you load onto your computer. And once you have a connection to the Internet established, you uh, start up your browser, and that will let you view pages on the All World right, so Wide Web. All right, so we have web. Netscape up here now, which is one of the most well-known browsers. Just show us a little bit how you would use it, Hallie. Um, I can scroll up and down when I bring up a page. Um, I can add So that's the home page, right? This so is tell the home us where you page. can go. This will tell us where you can go. Anywhere uh, that your mouse turns to a hand, you can click on, and that'll take you to another page. So that's a hot link that'll take you somewhere else. That's called a hot link, exactly. You can also sometimes uh, press on images that'll take you to other places. Or you can set bookmarks. Um, that is tag your favorite sites, mm -hmm. the, the favorite places you like to go. All right, now how do I figure out where I want to go? How do I find things? There are things called search engines. Uh, let's take a look at one. There are two places. One is Yahoo, and Yahoo is uh, kind of the definitive inter internet directory. Mm -hmm. um, you can pretty much find more information on anything you're looking for So I can here. just type in a keyword and say I'm interested in stuff on games, say, for example. Exactly. So would you, let's do that. I, mean, see I could happens. type in the keyword games, Okay. click on search. And what's it doing? It is looking through a huge database of sites and looking for the word games anywhere in that database. And it's already found a zillion of them. And right it's there. found a zillion of them. And you can click on what you want here. Suppose I don't know a keyword. Now, there's another way to do that, too, isn't there? Um, there's a place called Excite, and they've come up with a search engine where you actually just type in a concept or an idea. Show me. Like, I would like to find some games for my computer. So you can just talk English, ask it a question. Exactly. It'll figure out what you're really looking it's for. It's an intelligent search engine. Uh huh. And it'll come up with the same kinds of stuff. Same kinds of things. Okay. And they are rated. That's right. So you don't have to be a genius and know ahead of time what you're looking for. Exactly. Last question. There's something called netiquette. There's a sort of way of behaving on the internet that's mm -hmm. cool and not cool. What's that about? Um, the general rule is you don't want to do anything on the internet that you wouldn't do in real life. For example, uh, if you're in a chat room, you don't want to use all capital letters. Mm -hmm. um, that's considered shouting and it's considered rude. Okay. Uh, you don't want to harass people on the internet and you always want to reply to your emails. 
Okay, so be polite, be considerate be polite of others. Be polite and The usual social <laughs> rules. Exactly. All right, Hallie, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, well, to get onto the net, you need access. We talked about that. There are many ways to get it into the Internet, as we've just discussed. But which kind of service provider is best for you? Well, we visited both ends of the ISP spectrum. Choosing an Internet service provider is not unlike finding a good plumber or contractor. Computer users must wonder if the company is reputable, if it has qualified employees, or the right equipment. The competition is severe, and finding differences between small and large providers is not always evident, except, of course, among service providers themselves. One of the things that happens in this industry is a company will, somebody will say, I want to go into the, this is a popular business, I want to be an ISP. So they go out and they build, you know, some, some sort of a system for people to log into. Then what happens is, and they say, okay, if, in order for me to com compete, I'm going to offer this at a cheap price. So they go out, they offer it at a cheap price, and then suddenly they have three or 400 customers, and they have no way of supporting them because they didn't build a network that's very scalable. CRL is one of the largest ISPs in the United States. The company's network is fully redundant and backed up with diesel generators. CRL is also building its own high-speed ATM, or asynchronous transfer mode, network. The ATM technology gives us the ability to move packets or move cells of information around on the same internet network um, without having to look at each individual IP address on the packets. And so, in essence, what's happening is it's less processing time. But there are many smaller regional providers as well who have garnered a loyal base of local customers less concerned about backbone speed and size than service. Even if you have a great backbone, if nobody answers your phones, if you don't have technical support, if you don't have any way for your customers to get online, um, if your phone lines go off, hook, your modems break down, your T1 connection drops, uh, it doesn't do you any good. The point is, is if you have a good connection and a competent staff, you're getting which, what the people want is connectivity, and that's it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. One of the big issues on the internet is security, and there are two main aspects to that issue, access control and financial security. We're going to start by looking at one way a parent or a teacher or an employer can set some guidelines for what can be accessed. And Nigel, that's your product. You've got up here something called Cyber Patrol. And I guess the first thing you can do with Cyber Patrol is actually set the times that your kids can go online or, or you can keep them from going online, right? That's exactly right. So what are we so, seeing here? Well, what we're looking at here is the headquarters screen that a parent or an educator would use to set the times during a week when access was permitted to the internet. And within, so when it's green, you have access. Everybody gets to have dinner together to get mm. each evening. Uh, you get a break on the weekend for the youngsters, but during the week they shut down at 9 o'clock. So as the parent, I can set this up and Absolutely. say, during these periods of time where it's red right now, you will not be able to get onto the internet. That's correct. And you can monitor the total number of hours that they spend in a day and the total number of hours that they're, on con they're connected during a week. So you get some level of management of your budget. Okay. Now, uh, you know most kids are better at this than their parents are. I mean, how hard is it to get in here and break through this thing if I'm the kid? It's reasonably... T it's reasonably tamper-proof. Password protected Password for the Password protected for the parents and defensive in the way that the program itself is structured throughout the system such that uh, deleting any piece of it will cause other components to recognize okay. that it's been attacked so and it will lock up at that point until a parent comes along, slaps you on the wrist and then okay. resets everything. So the first thing I can do with Cyber Patrol is regulate when my kids will go online. Now how about controlling what they can access when they're okay. online? Okay, we have uh, coverage for relay chat, for the web group, you know, websites, for news groups and the way that this is set is we have a team of researchers, mm -hmm. educators and parents specifically because our target was what was good for a 12 year old child unattended at the computer. And th they have been reviewing material for the last several months. So you've gone ahead and kind of pre-rated all the possible sites out there on the We net. have as many as we can cover, and we've been obviously using the search engines to mm -hmm. follow the areas and categories. We publish the criteria by which these, uh, you know, these particular categories mm. are defined. And the product as standard comes to you with all of these defaulted out. As a parent, you know, you're the person who's responsible. You're the person who's setting the standards for your child. And so you have the ability to turn these categories 
on or off. Right. So I'm saying they can't go anywhere with nudity, sex acts, racist stuff, satanic stuff, all that kind of thing. Right. But, but I can go in there and say, well, gambling, I think, is okay. That's exactly right. And then you would save those values, and those would be the values that would be uh, provided for your children. And is this dynamic? I mean, you guys continuing you, to, continuing the, to update your purchase list? purchase price of the products includes six months worth of weekly downloads of the updated okay. list, and it's a very very dynamic area, as you can appreciate. When you're within any of those categories, then within a particular area, such as the web access, you can impose certain specific restrictions or certain specific mm -hmm. approvals. For example, you might have blocked alcohol, but you might have enabled specifically virtual vineyards because yeah. you'd heard yeah. you know, in your, um, from your friends that they had a very useful right. uh, tutorial about how wine Nigel, is Nigel, show me what actually happens here. I'm the kid okay. and I try to log on to the Playboy homepage. Well, let's, uh, let's figure that you are uh, sitting here and you open. You want to open Playboy. Right. So there it is. Playboy comes it's up. It says, Cyber Patrol will not let me get to the Playboy That's site. exactly right. And you'll notice here that we've actually evolved to be able to include sponsorship messages. If you purchase the if you try yeah. the product and elect to uh, not to purchase it for its time management as well as its filtering, but you just want blocking for those basic violence and profanity and sexual groups, mm -hmm. then Cyber Patrol is available for free. Free. You can download it. You, you just have to sort of watch your You can messages. download it and you watch okay. the messages and you give us back some demographic information that we can use. Nigel, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. The other concern on the internet, especially as we move full steam ahead to cyber commerce, is the safety and security of online financial transactions. I guess, Dave, that's your area. And you've got something called WebTrader. And as I understand it, WebTrader lets me, as a businessman, set up a virtual storefront and, as a consumer, conduct a safe. Uh, financial transaction with that with that business. That's correct. All right. So start me out. What do, what do we have up here? This is a company called New York Smoke Fish. That's, that's correct. It's using Web Trader to sell online. This is one of our customers that's actually running the product today. They put up a home page. You know, so far people have been putting up you know access to the internet by getting uh, access with browsers. Mm -hmm. Now you're seeing people set up home pages so they can do business on the internet. And this home page serves as the front door to this business on the internet. So this is like walking into the store. That's correct. And can I? How do I shop around there? Well, you look at the catalog. Uh, they have a catalog of the products that they sell. You can scroll through this catalog and, some and salmon, some smoked whitefish. Exactly. Okay. It leads you down to the order point. All right, so I want to buy some of the smoked salmon. I just click on order. That's right. Now, in most catalogs, you would have a phone number or you might uh, have a bounce back card. Right. On the internet, you've got this equivalent of the self addressed stamp envelope that goes back electronically by encrypted email. Order it, pay for it right now. Exactly. In fact, we'll go ahead here and fill out this order form. So I am actually sitting here. So I'm really going to email my order essentially to the smoked fish company. That's correct. All right, now let's, let's get to the credit card number part, all right? Because that's what we're interested in. That's here. where it gets easy, interesting. Yeah, so it says he wants my credit card number. Now, can I feel safe in putting my credit card number in there? This is the first issue that we had to address when we built this application. And we've licensed RSA's encryption algorithm to encrypt this credit card number so that when it travels across the internet, it's secure. Okay. Now, on the other hand, we have to remember that if I were to call this guy on the phone, he would have said, give me your credit card number, and I'd just read it on the phone to him, right? That's right. Probably without any security. That's right. Okay, so this is, you're telling me this is safe for me to put my credit card on here, and, and it's, I can buy the stuff, and if, and if I'm running Stu's florist shop, I can just call you guys and with WebTrader set up my virtual storefront here. That's correct. Now, there's also, uh, how do you find me, though? I mean, do you have a kind of mall metaphor that you use? We do. As a matter of fact, uh, we've got a mall of businesses uh, that are offering products on the Internet today, and we call it businessone.com. Here you'll find businesses selling products today. You'll find installers that are out there installing commerce systems in local communities. We have over... 400 local internet business consultants that can help you in install the internet right, services. So if I want to set up my virtual storefront, what do I do? I call you, do I buy a piece of software? How's it work? Well, you can try it out on the internet. You can uh, try some of our, uh, our, uh -huh. our companies and order some products. Uh, and then uh, you can look at our, our website. Uh, we'll have somebody come visit you and look mm -hmm. at your needs, uh, do a, a security assessment of uh, what's needed for your business, and install WebTrader to meet your sales and marketing needs. So this stuff is for real now. You it's happening. It. Right. Hundreds of people are doing it today. All right, Dave, thanks a lot. All right, well, the World Wide Web is fast becoming not only about computers, but it's radio, it's television, all wrapped up into one. In fact, the latest hit on the net is Ferndale. It's the world's first online interactive soap opera. Baby out there, I gotta mind my P's and Q's. 
But in here, I do what I want. Got that? This is the cast of Ferndale, the interactive internet soap opera. At least it's the photographed cast of characters as seen on Ferndale's website. There are also audio actors and keyboard actors to answer and interact online. Ferndale is a mythical institution for neurotics that exists only in cyberspace. Patients attempt to cure themselves through net therapy, revealing their every secret over the internet. Within two weeks of Ferndale's first appearance, it attracted 100,000 visits per day. You know, I, I think the appeal for what we're doing at Ferndale and some of my other projects is, is the voyeuristic sense of the average internet user. I tell you, people want to know what I've got in my pants pockets. If, if you could look in my wallet, look in my pants pockets, you would know more about me than I would ever want you to know. If I could go into your car and take a look and see what was inside your glove compartment, there'd be untold secrets there. And so that's the storytelling technique that we use in Ferndale. Is it's a documentation type of story. I call it faction, where we take facts, documents, either real or made up, and use them as a storytelling device. Instead of reading about Ferndale, website visitors explore artifacts and journals. They can examine certificates, documents, and notes made by Ferndale's residents. There is the sullen musician Danny, and a woman addicted to television, and Sister Ruth, the nun prone to violence. The patient's problems become all too evident during live therapy sessions, where the cutting exchanges can lead to vengeful reprisals. See, Danny is this little bass player. Absolutely horrible. And he picks on me constantly just because I can't cook. <laughs> but I'm the one who's supposed to be feeding them. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> it's a small detail, but so I whacked him on the head. Wouldn't you have done the same thing? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Probably the hottest thing to hit the web since its initial explosion into public consciousness is Java, the new object-oriented platform-independent programming environment from Sun Microsystems. Here to show Java to us is John Gage, director of the science office at Sun. Welcome, John. All right, let's take a look at what Java does. People have heard of it, but a lot of people still don't know what it does. What's this example we're looking at right now? This is a web page. It's a web page on a PC. It could be on a Mac, on any other machine. But stuff is moving. Stuff is moving. An application is running locally here in the page. When I do this, it activates a thousand byte program that just moves that text like that. Tiny application. Okay. So so, so that looks, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, so yeah. that application was downloaded from a set of thousands out on the net. That anyone can add them to their pages. Uh, here's a page you go to find all these applets, www.javasoft.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you in particular uh, some that let you yourself alter what your page looks like. Here's a normal page, mm -hmm. graphics text, but if you come down on the page and find things that look like graphics, suddenly you realize... So that cube just looks like another dumb graphic. But it's not. It's a program running locally. This is why Java is so important. So anyone there's a little application this. underneath there doing that 3D Could rotation. have been written by anyone, could come from anywhere. So there are many powerful things you can do okay, with this. And again, more importantly, I mean, you can do real educational stuff like this example I can here. Bring it in this page is a 2,000 byte three-dimensional representation program all sorting that makes the front molecule. Yeah, and we're not only rotate. rotating, we're really simulating we're what simulating goes on inside the molecule. Here, here locally. So this breaks up all large applications. It breaks up all large operating systems. It lets us do completely different things. If you, for example, want to do three-dimensional visualization, here is three-dimensional okay, human so body. So again, this looks like just another sort of dumb graphic sitting on a web page, right. but it's not. Here's a program running that takes the three-dimensional person here. This is the famous sliced the human being. The guy who got sliced up into all the millions of slices. That's right. In the top of the image, you can see the current section, his arms and his torso. Right. But now, if I ask the program that's now residing locally to recompute what he looks like, I say go, and it recomputes his body, and you'll see there is the cut at his knees. So the graphic has changed because it has responded to my instructions A to that real three-dimensional model running locally, first time possible. Now you said running locally. I want to make sure we understand that on my PC, and I and I don't need a lot of power to do that. That's right. It, it lets us make a machine as small as my cell phone, because I don't need 40 megabytes of memory in a PC. I just bring a thousand or two thousand byte application across the net 
when I need it. It's the end of the operating systems and large applications. Yeah, and what's important have. from the point of view of both the guy who writes the app and me who uses it is it's platform independent. It doesn't matter whether I have a Mac or I've got Unix or whatever I have. That's right? right, and it's designed from the beginning to be secure. It eliminates the problems in security that are present in C and C++. Now, John, doesn't this really change the entire model for software distribution. I mean, I can be Microsoft now, right? That's right. Well, since Microsoft has adopted this, and so has <laughs> IBM, and so has Lotus, and so has Macromedia, everyone has f decided that movement of dynamic content on the web is the most powerful model for new applications and for distribution of applications. And once I write an app, it's written. I don't have to rewrite it for the Mac and rewrite it for this and rewrite it for that. That's right. When it arrives locally, it arrives in a virtual machine on the Mac. It uses the Mac widgets. It uses yeah, the Windows yeah, 95 yeah. widgets. It looks Mac-ish, but it could be written once on a Sun or on any other machine and run just fine everywhere else. And that's else. Java, and you can pull it down from the Java software. www.javasoft. It's all there. Everyone can download the version, run it on the Mac, run it on under NT, under Windows 95. John, and, thanks and a lot. create new software. Okay. All right, well, while the net is great, it also offers quite a few challenges, like finding what you want or mastering HTML. Here with some tips on surviving on the net is our net master, Giles Bateman. Thanks, Stuart. Now, depending on your level of understanding or expertise, I have a number of recommendations for you. First of all, let's start with, uh, for the beginners, here is the Netiquette homepage. Uh, this is a great collection of information about how uh, one is expected to behave in the online community. What's really cool here is they've got it translated into German, Italian, Spanish, and French, so it's not just for English-speaking uh, users. But if we click here, we can find out about different aspects of the Internet, from electronic mail to uh, using FTP, discussion groups, and World Wide Web. You can find out all about Internet culture and learn how you can behave and get along. If you're a new user, it will behoove you to visit this site. Now, next of all, we have uh, search engines. I think these are very useful. A lot of people go buy books to find something they're interested in on the Internet. I say go to one of the search engines like Lycos, type in the word you're interested in, and use their search function. They've also got uh, a number of their links categorized down here. I believe they've got somewhere in the millions. Now, last but not least, if you are getting all into this online stuff, you may decide that you want to become a webmaster yourself. Definitely check out A Beginner's Guide to HTML. This steps you through all the different aspects of the language and will give you a healthy understanding of the hypertext markup language. Thanks, Giles. Now time for our weekly summary of what's new in the field of personal computing. Here's this week's Random Access. In the random access file this week, UK researchers say they have discovered the first virus specifically targeted at Windows 95. Analysts have named the virus Boza after a Bulgarian liquor. The virus attaches itself to existing programs, makes copies of itself while they run, and the copies are then attached to other programs. Advanced micro devices Cyrix, IBM, and SGS Thompson have joined together to announce a new rating system for microprocessor performance. Called the P rating, the new evaluation system relates the results of industry standard benchmarks to what is achieved by an Intel Pentium processor of a given frequency. Compaq introduced a new line of home multimedia PCs this week. The new Presario 7232 features a scanner keyboard, allowing you to scan documents and graphics into a scanner built into the keyboard. And the Presario 9240 includes the industry's first standard rewritable optical PC CD drive. Computer maker Digitally Equipment Corporation is getting out of the home computer market. DEC will discontinue its story online of PCs targeted at consumers and focus instead on selling PCs to businesses. MasterCard and Visa are joining forces to create a technical standard for safeguarding credit card purchases made over the Internet. Called Secure Electronic Transactions, or SET, they plan to test the specifications this spring. Computer printers have become the water coolers of the 90s, a place where gossip and rumors often start because of the printouts lying around. Xerox has created the anti-snoop printer to combat this problem. Documents are sent to locked mailboxes that can be only opened with the proper security code. And if you're looking for more information to make up your mind on who to vote for in the upcoming presidential primaries, check out Vote America from Virtual Entertainment. The CD offers a nonpartisan one-stop guide to the candidates, issues, and the election process. To keep up with the latest changes in the campaign, you can download real-time updates from Vote America's worldwide web page. That's going to do it for this week's Random Access. We'll send it back to you, Stuart. 
Now for my pick of the week, and this has nothing to do with the Internet. My pick is a new game from Digital Pictures called Quarterback Attack. Let me tell you why I like this. First of all, it runs right off the CD-ROM. You don't have to install it. It won't take up half your hard drive. It isn't a RAM monster. It just plays. Second, this is one heck of a piece of game programming. Frankly, I don't know how they did it. It is full screen, full motion video. It branches to new situations almost instantly. And this game runs just as well on an older, slower 486 as it does on a Pentium. Third, it's a great game. Digital Pictures actually calls it a quarterback simulator, which it is. Your heart really gets pumping when you play this thing. Those defensive linemen are coming after you. You're scanning the field, looking for open receivers. In fact, this is such a good training tool for quarterbacks that if you're a college or pro football coach, Digital Pictures will send you a free copy for use in training your team's quarterbacks. QB Attack is available for Windows, the Mac, Sega Saturn, and 3DO. I love it. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week.